Hey guys, this is Tyler taking another step on the journey to master programmer. In the last couple videos, we talked about adders and we made those up completely, designed them out. Hopefully you made them in HDL. Now what we have to do is create an ALU, specifically the hack ALU. Hack is just going to be the name of the computer that we're making. This creates a separation. Everything we've created so far, such as our logic gates and our adders, those are more general and are used throughout all of computing. The hack ALU is going to be specific to our computer. There are other ways for ALUs to be designed that can be more robust. However, our ALU for our hack computer is going to be much more simple. That means it's going to be easier to implement and easier to understand, but still provide us enough power to do what we want to do. We will, of course, as always, be using all of the tools that we've created beforehand. So what is an ALU supposed to do? Well, an ALU takes two multi-bit buses, in our case, 16 bits, and it will produce one main 16-bit output, but it will also take in several other control bits and output two other sort of flags. What these control bits are set to determine what operations we're going to perform on our two inputs. Starting at the left, we have ZX. That zeroes the X input, which I just have as A. So A is going to be re referred to as X, and B is going to refer to Y. So ZX, if that's set to 1, it'll make A, all of its bits, equal to 0. If ZX is equal to 0, then it leaves A alone. NX negates A. It will flip every single bit to the opposite value. However, it negates the A that's passed through ZX. So if ZX had previously zeroed all of A, then it will negate all of those zeros to be ones. If ZX left A alone, then it will negate the value of A. The same thing occurs with ZY and NY, but in reference to B. Again, ZY occurs first, and then NY occurs afterwards. They're sequential. The order matters. After we've done that, we have to do an operation on them. F decides the operation that we perform. If F is zero, then we will bitwise AND A and B. So we will compare each bit and see if they are equal to each other. If F is one, we will add A and B together. After we've completed the operation through F, NO will negate that output if NO is set to one. Whatever the result of F is, NO will negate that. Or if it's set to zero, it'll just pass it as it is to out. That's all of the control bits. Our flags is ZR, which will be true only if the output is completely zero. Zero all of the bits across, and that represents the value of zero. NG will be true if out is a negative value. So now we know the interface of the ALU. The inputs are going to be on the top and the left, all of these inputs, and the outputs are on the right and bottom. All of these are outputs. The implementation is a little bit more complicated than anything we've done before. To start things off in a small, easier to digest manner, I decided the path I wanted to take was to calculate ZX and then worry about calculating NX and then worry about calculating ZY and NY and then F and then O. I wanted to separate each of these into their own logical components. Not chips, but just focus on each as a part. When trying to figure out ZX, I was having a tough time. At first I thought I could do something like this. I would pass ZX through a NOT gate which will flip its value and then pass it into a 16-bit AND with the A input. If ZX was zero, then it would not to one, which would always be true and only depend on sending out trues if each bit in the A were true. And that's what you would want if ZX was zero. It wouldn't affect the A at all. And then if ZX was one, it would flip to zero. It would negate this AND. Every single one would fail, so it would just output a bunch of zeros, which is what you want if ZX is one. That's nice in theory, but this 16-bit AND gate doesn't take in a single bit like the ZX. I was having similar problems like this for the rest of each control bit. I was neglecting an important tool in my toolbox, the MUX and the MUX 16. I have probably discluded this because I haven't had as much experience with using MUX gates. In programming, this is often the case. You're not going to know how to use your tools until you need to use the tools and realize you can use them. That's how you gain experience. And from now on, when I'm designing chips, I'll always know that I can use MUX for this specific purpose. Growing in skill is hard, but it's worthwhile. So the way I'm going to use MUX is I'm going to use it as an if statement. Here I have this designed out. 
if zx, then we'll put out false. If not zx, then we'll put out a. The way this works is if zx is zero, it allows a to pass through. And if zx is one, it allows false to pass through. You are allowed to pass false and true as values. False, of course, is zero, and true, of course, is one. Because zx sets everything to zero, false works for our purposes. And that's actually all we need to calculate for zx. The output here is actually able to go into nx now. I can sort of abstractify this and just call it my zx gate. Here's where I next had an issue when designing the ALU. I didn't know how to go from two different paths and select between one of each path. I thought, say, if nx was 1, then I would take a and then negate it. And if nx was 0, then I would just pass through a. When I figured out how to use the mux gate correctly, this kind of solved the problem. I realized that instead of seeing the control bit first and then performing on it, I would do both calculations and then decide which calculation I wanted to keep based on the control bit. I demonstrate that concept here. I'm passing the output directly into a mux, but I'm also passing that negated output into the mux. So I had to do the calculation beforehand before I knew which one I wanted. Now I have them both. It's just a matter of which one I should keep. And that's decided with nx. If nx is 1, then we'll keep the negated path. And if nx is 0, then we'll keep the unaltered path. Now this output can be connected into the next step in our ALU. And we can actually abstractify this part as the nx piece. I went ahead and minimized that, sort of kept those abstractions into a small part so I could fit more of the design. And I also created the same thing for B with respect of ZY and NY. These first processes on A and B are the exact same thing and they don't affect each other at this point so you can compute them in parallel. Now comes the part where they will merge and that depends on the F bit. Like I said though, we're going to do the calculations first for the two separate paths and then decide between them with the F bit. The path that A and B are now going to take is whether they are going to be added together or if they're going to be compared through an AND gate. So you can see here, I AND them, and here I add them, and they're on their own separate paths. Now I just decide between the two with F bit. If F is 1, we keep the ADD path, and F is 0, we keep the AND path. The output of this is going to be fed into the next step of the ALU, and we can of course abstractify all of this part. Our next and last control bit is NO, which negates whatever's coming out of F. We've already seen this before with NX and NY. We just create two separate paths, one which keeps the current value and one which will negate the current value. We pass those through a mux and use NO as the selector bit. The output of this is actually going to be the full output of our ALU. However, we still have two other outputs that we need to worry about. This is another piece I got stuck on because you can't take out and force that into the other outputs. You have to go from this point right here. This is important in HDL where you are forced to go through this output right here, the output of the mux. We'll immediately split off of this mux and we'll worry about the individual bits. First of all, we look at bit 15. Bit 15 is the leftmost bit. We know that this is the bit that determines whether or not something is negative. If bit 15 is negative, it'll be 1, which we want ng to be 1 in that case. If bit 15 is 0, then it'll be positive and we want ng to be 0 in that case. So we can just feed bit 15 directly into ng, and that satisfies what we want with that. Next, we want to see zr. zr is whether it's 0 or not. A number is 0 only if all of the bits in it are 0. That means if any bit is 1 or true, that number is non-zero. So how do we tell if any bit in a set is true? Well, we use an OR gate. ORs, as soon as one of the OR in an array of ORs is set to true, all of the following ORs will be set to true as well, and that will go all the way to ZR. If all of the bits in an OR array are 0, that'll all coalesce down to 0, which we'll put out to ZR. We're working with a 16-bit bus out of this MUX, so we're going to need some way to turn multiple bits down into one bit. We can actually do this with our eight-way OR. 
the eight way or takes an eight bit bus and outputs one single bit, depending on whether or not any of those bits in the bus were true. So we're dealing with a 16 bit bus. So we should split that into two eight bit buses and pass those into two eight way ors. We will split that at zero to seven, which is the first eight and eight to 15, which are the last eight. If any single bit is true, then the eight way or gate that is passed into will output true. So we just need to connect these two eight way or gates with a simple or. Now that condenses a 16 bit bus all the way down into a single bit. And we pass that single bit into our ZR. Now we've completed our ALU. That's it. We can go ahead and abstractify this entire thing. That leads us back to our clean interface diagram that I drew earlier. So we definitely had some things to learn with designing this ALU. It wasn't all easy, but we did learn how to utilize some of our gates that we haven't used as much before, such as our MUX gate, which I haven't really used that in such a meaningful way before. Now that I know how to do it, I know how to use sort of an if statement in chip design. The other thing that I had the opportunity to use for the first time was the eight way OR gates. It was really interesting to see how I can condense a multi-bit bus down into a single bit. The other thing I learned in HDL was how to take an output from a gate and split that bus into multiple different outputs. I haven't done something like that yet, but I did that with the out 16 and outputting to ZR and NG as well. That had me uh, stuck for a little bit. Overall, in completing this ALU, we actually practice something. And this is something you'll see in programming all the time. You have to create something to learn how to create it. It's kind of a paradox how that's supposed to work, but really that's the way it works with everything. You have to learn how to create something by creating something. But we survived that challenge. We completed the ALU, which actually does complete week two. Thank you for following along with me as I go through the Nanda Tetris course, and I'll be coming back with week three soon.